All right. So we'll um, we'll have questions uh, in the discussion session after our next talk, which is by Andrew Worth. Uh, Andrew Worth um, uh, from the USA is an abstract painter whose uh, paintings are, are usually about ideas of self consciousness and making sense of reality. He has been exhibiting regularly at galleries throughout uh, the New Jersey, New York and Pennsylvania area for more than 15 years. Uh, after a first career as a software engineer with formal degrees from Carnegie Mellon University and computer engineering and information networking, he studied at many of the art institutions in New York City, including the School of Visual Arts, the New School and the Art Students League. And um, I'm uh, very, very pleased to, to show Andrew, uh, um, to have Andrew here and to, to let other people see his, uh, his, his, his abstract uh, painting work, which, is, um, which I find absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much, David. And thank you everybody for being here. My name is Andrew Wirth, and I'm happy to be joining you from uh, Princeton Junction, New Jersey on the East Coast of the United States. I'll be talking to you today about uh, my use of color effects towards my artistic vision. What I'll do is go with a, a brief background about uh, my philosophical inspirations and how those uh, tend to influence my art. I'll go through some of the color effects that you'll see in my paintings with the goals being to, uh, for art lovers to perhaps see some new ways of looking at abstract art and for the artists among you to perhaps inspire you to think about some new techniques for your own paintings. As David mentioned, uh, I started my first career as a software engineer, but found myself uh, after a while burnt out and looking to try something different. So I moved to Manhattan uh, and started taking classes at all the different schools in the city. Back then, you could sign up at uh, various universities and just uh, participate without being a full-time matriculated student, um, something you'd probably take MOOCs or, or YouTube these days. Um, and I started taking classes in philosophy, cognitive psychology, neuroscience, as well as art techniques and art history. The thinking was that I would perhaps go back to school for a PhD in uh, cognitive science. Um, but after a couple of years of taking classes and some discussions with my professors, um, a few of whom didn't seem particularly um, uh, uh, satisfied with the academic life, I decided not to go for the PhD, but instead to spend my time making artwork about my interests in philosophy and cognitive science and related topics. Um, those tend to re revolve around ideas like the explanatory gap, or how is it that our brains are able to create subjective experience? We know a lot about how brains work. We know a lot about psychology, but there's a gap between explaining how physical brains can create um, psychological subjective experience. A lot of my work is about the nature of the self and how our minds are embodied and an, a, a topic called inaction, which I'll explain a little bit later. In this painting here, I'm using a touring pattern as the uh, main compositional element that derives from initial seed image that was a self-portrait I had done in graphite. I'll explain Turing patterns a little bit more, just a bit. Of all the classes that I took uh, while I was in New York, color theory was my favorite class. It's been an ongoing inspiration area of learning. And as you'll see, it's the key element in most of my paintings. When people ask me what kind of uh, painting I do, the phrase that I've settled on is organized organic abstraction to uh, use the term that was coined by artist and art critic, Richard Kalina, who, who writes, in contemporary painting, organized organic abstraction presents itself as a form of abstraction characterized by a more distanced and grammatical approach, often borrowing elements from both geometric and gestural abstractions. And in this painting, the affect effect, it's about how affect or your mood literally and metaphorically colors the way we see the world. The key formal elements in my paintings include thousands of these little hand painted marks of color. Uh, color gradients, almost uh, probably every painting I'll show today has color gradients with colors interacting at different scales and things called Turing patterns and some other uh, mathematical structures like fractals, tessellations and waves show up in some of my work. I thought I'd start with a, a little painting demo. I know it's sometimes difficult to see videos over Zoom, but I think you'll get a chance to a good feeling for what my work looks like and how it's made. It's a very mindful meditative process of applying one brushstroke of color after another. Um, each brushstroke is essentially a chance for an independent uh, 
um, color interaction experiment. In this painting, I have two gradients working here. On the underpainting, I have a violet to yellow underpainting, where these marks that I'm making, these little brainy maze-like marks, are another gradient moving from orange at the top to blue at the bottom. And I use a water-soluble pencil here to um, sort of mark my way, keep track of things. And on my palette, I'm using a little paper fastener to keep track of where I am. And I just proceed down through the um, painting, selecting colors from the pre-mixed gradient until the painting is finished. And this is one from my Center of Narrative Gravi Gravity series. Uh, one of the books that influenced me a lot early on was Dan Dennett's Consciousness Explained. Um, he writes, contemplating what the nature of the self is, he says that physicists appreciate the enormous simplification you get when you posit a center of gravity for an object, a single point relative to which all gravitational forces may be calculated. We heterophenomenologists appreciate the enormous, enormous simplification you get when you posit a center of narrative gravity for a narrative spinning human body. Seems like center of gravities are going to be uh, prominent in our discussions today. Um, Dan Dennett here is, is talking about how um, the self is perhaps a useful abstraction, not a real thing, but something with a maybe fuzzy core, um, hard to pin down. Um, it's been an ongoing series of works of mine now numbering more than 50 paintings. Most of them are, are 12 inches by 12 inches with two gradients like the one in the demo. Um, that interact at sort of different scales and different spaces. So you might see orbs or indentations or waves, depending on uh, how far away you stand from the pieces. Another element in, in many of my paintings are what are called Turing patterns. Alan Turing was a British mathematician well known for his work as a code breaker during World War II, uh, as well as being one of the founders of computer science. But late in his life, he wrote a paper on how patterns could form in nature such as these shapes on these uh, giant puffer fish and the zebra, even the pattern of cells and cells in the brain, um, if you were to look at the visual cortex and divide them into ones that respond primarily to the left eye or the right eye, they form this, what's called an ocular dominance map, which some people think anyway, might be formed by something like the Turing process. Now, um, I simulate this process on the computer. In this example, I started from a random noise and uh, wrote a Python script that does the reaction diffusion process, which um, includes uh, short range activation and long range inhibition. In practice, for most of my paintings, I actually use Photoshop uh, rather than the Python script for creative purposes. Uh, and you can do that simply by taking an image and blurring it and sharpening it over and over and over again until you eventually reach a Turing pattern. Uh, if you're interested in the mathematics of how that works, you can look uh, for my paper or YouTube talk on Turing patterns in Photoshop. Um, in the previous example, I worked, I started from random noise here in, for this painting, I started with a Matisse painting the dance to create the Turing pattern and then sampled colors from Matisse's painting when filling in the marks in the underpainting to build my abstracted version of the dance. Now, one of the things that um, I've mentioned a few times are the use of gradients in this painting, which is about introspection. Uh, there is a Turing pattern that's painted with uh, this mustard yellow and this green. And on top of that, the marks are painted in a gradient from yellow, proceeding this way and wrapping around, and another gradient in going blue, going this way and wrapping around. So you get a variety of different sort of interactions based on value and color um, between the marks and the underpainting to create um, a sense of depth and light. I thought I'd show an example of how I make these gradients. Um, typically start with two destinations, a starting point and an ending point, often light to dark, but um, there could be hue shifts along the way. And uh, you can repeatedly mix midpoints between the two. So if I start with one on either end, and then I mix a midpoint, and then two more midpoints and two more midpoints, I would end up with um, a nine step gradient. Uh, and then if you mix uh, eight more midpoints between those, you'll end up with 17 steps. And then if you mix another 16 midpoints between that, you'll end up with a 33 step gradient, which for the size paintings that I'm making and the kind of granularity and the typical viewing distance, I found that 33 steps makes a pretty smooth looking gradient uh, when the piece is finished. Uh, the biggest challenge here is if the two ends are 
both the similar opacity and similar tinting strength. It's not so hard to find the midpoints perceptually, a little bit of working back and forth. But if you're working with a phthalo on one end, for instance, and a yellow on the other, um, it's a much bigger challenge sort of getting the paints to mix out. So you have a relatively even number of paints uh, each step along the gradient. Here are some examples of uh, gradients that I've used in recent paintings. Um, this one here, I have some metallic paints in as well, which is why sort of the paints look a little bit on the metallic side. Uh, I've recently been thinking about uh, predictive processing, which is an idea in cognitive science that uh, um, the brain is not merely a passive receiver of sensations from the world, but it also is making predictions about the world. And that the difference between our sensations and those predictions helps shape what we perceive as being reality. Um, I started work on this series when I found this great quote by uh, neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett uh, in a podcast interview. And she says, your brain is basically using the past to predict the future as a way of controlling your body and creating your experience in the present. And that captures exactly what I was trying to get at with this series um, of paintings. Each one of them has a 180 degree rotational symmetry, which I think of sort of metaphorically as time. So there's a sense of where there's a past and then there's a future and kind of in the middle where it meets is where you are right now. Um, in that first painting, uh, the predictive self number one, in pretty much all of my paintings, you have what a kind of optical mixing going on. So up here on the top right, um, this yellow here is mixing with a, um, a red oxide underpainting and it appears fairly orange when you see it. Uh, this is what David called additive averaging mixing, I think. Um, and it, this is actually the same paint here in the middle of the painting. It's the same exact yellow. Now, it's not perfectly the same on my sample here. Be I think because the paint is not completely opaque, so there's a little bit of a transparency effect here as well as the optical mixing. But this yellow is on a violet underpainting. And so in the middle of this piece, the yellow comes out when you see stand a little bit back as a less chromatic, um, more white looking yellow. Similarly for the blue on the top right part of the painting, it's a fairly chromatic look when you're having the blue inter uh, adding or optically mixing with the violet underpainting. But in the middle of the painting where you have the blue on top of the red oxide, it turns into a more um, uh, dull down grayish blue. I mentioned early on the idea of an action. Although I was a, a computer engineer in my undergraduate studies, um, that uh, makes me um, fond of the computational theory of mind, but I'm also uh, fascinated by alternate paradigms for cognitive science. And uh, one of them is the idea of, of an action, um, which is the idea that cognition is grounded in the sensory motor dynamics of the interactions between the living organism and its environment. Um, the idea being that, um, again, we're not just passive receivers of data, we have to enact our reality. There's a back and forth. Uh, all of our senses, for instance, the sense of, of touch, you have to move your hand to touch something, to see things, as David showed in his demo. You have to move your eyes in order to uh, make sense of the world. Even the sense of smell, you have to move air into your body in order for smell to work. So there's a sense where... Um, you have to interact with your environment in order to, for us to perceive the world. And I wanted to try and make this, I like to make this sort of more ex explicit, this idea in some of my paintings, well, really all of them. Um, and one of the ways that I do that is through the use of metallic paint, like these copper and uh, gold, and interference paints, like these over here. The interference paints have um, uh, mica flakes in them, and they can flip color based on whether you catch the light directly or you look indirectly at them. So for instance, the interference red can appear either red or actually sort of green, depending on whether you catch the light in a certain way and what the underpainting is. So for example, one of these predictive self paintings over here on the left, this part of the underpainting is an interference green. And when you're not looking at the light, it's a fairly dull green, low chroma, middle valued. Uh, but then if you look at it from the opposite direction so that the light is look, shining directly off of it, reflecting back towards your eye, the green suddenly becomes brilliant, probably not even accurately captured here in the photo. And it jumps up a couple of value steps. The chroma becomes much more prominent. Um, 
And there's a little bit of a hue shift as well, though that's not quite as so obvious here. But for the blue marks, these blue marks here, uh, when, those are also an interference blue, probably tinted with some actual uh, blue pigment. I don't remember for sure. Um, but when you catch them on the other side, looking at the light, there's a dramatic hue shift. Uh, the lightness goes up a little bit and um, a slight boost in chroma. So here it looks blue and here it's a pretty dramatic reflective purple. So to see these paints, you really have to kind of, these, uh, these paintings, you really have to kind of move around, look at them from farther back and up close. Um, it might be a little difficult to tell on zoom, but uh, the painting on the left, it optically integrates, you really just see the, the marks and you see it reads pretty much as an orange. But when you catch the light and you look at it from further away, the green and the orange tend to add up. And it, if you squint a little bit, you can see it reads a little bit more like a yellow. So again, I'll have these paintings will be sort of interactive in the way that they work for the viewer. Similarly, I occasionally use um, reflective supports. So um, aluminum composite panels underneath where the uh, support is a shiny aluminum that I might paint part of it as an opaque um, uh, touring pattern. And part of it I'll leave as a tinted um, underpainting. So a glaze, a thin purple glaze in this example. I'm also using interference paint. So as you move along this particular piece, you get complete flips of positive to negative between where the underpainting was opaque versus transparent. And you can also see the uh, interference paints flipping. So here's really dark right now, but as I come back at it and catch the light, the green suddenly start to blaze and the underpainting, which is a purple here, you can start to see that come through as well. So again, these paintings are, are, can, can be fairly interactive. Another book that um, had a big influence on me was uh, The Embodied Mind, um, where Varela, Thompson, and Roche uh, are contemplating the self again. And they write that at every moment of our lives, there is something going on, some experience. We see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think. What is this self, this ego center that appears and disappears, that seems so constant, yet so fragile, so familiar, yet so elusive? And this idea and others has inspired a series of paintings of mine called Elusive. Um, here, this piece, this here is a photograph of the actual underpainting. Um, it's a much larger than the center of gravity pieces. It's 36 by 36 inches. And it's a purple gradient from dark to light with a vertical swirl clockwise. And then the marks painted on top of the painting are um, two, additional gradients. These are digital simulations, it's not the actual um, gradients that I used, but um, I have a yellow to red gradient that's a horizontal um, with a counterclockwise swirl and a, a light to dark turquoise with a, a vertical counterclockwise swirl. When you put them all together, you get this sort of, again, elusive sense of where the boundaries are, depending on how far away you stand. You, can, you might see an indentation, you might see it lit from the top or the bottom. Um, and I have the, the touring patterns as well. Uh, one of the classes I took uh, when I was living in New York um, that I found really interesting was called Philosophy in the Flesh based on the book by Lakoff and Johnson. And their thesis is that the mind is inherently embodied, which is that we perceive the things that we, the way we do because of the way we're physically built. Um, thought is mostly unconscious and abstract concepts are largely metaphorical. Um, if you go through a bunch of the Lakoff and Johnson books, you'll see that he lists lots and lots of these metaphors that they call um, embodied conceptual metaphor, things that we, we don't even think about. They, they just sort of grow into us by virtue of, of us being uh, human beings. Um, and we use them to think and speak and reason about the world. In particular, the bottom two here, knowing is seeing and understanding is grasping. Um, we use in phrases like, I see what you mean. Let's sh shine some light on that topic where I can get my head around that idea. I've got a handle on the subject. And we don't even sometimes think that the, of these as metaf metaphorical, but they are. And I like to think about ways that I can bring these ideas into some of my paintings. So here we have a piece, um, Comprehension, which is ab about that idea, where the Turing pattern has been styled to sort of show a, a grasping or getting your head handle around an idea with an inner light, shining a light on a subject. Now, um, 
for most people will see this painting as having a lot of depth to it. Uh, that is called chromostereopsis, which is the perception of depth due to color variation. And in most examples, you'll see it's red versus blue, with the idea being that uh, red and blue are on the opposite ends of the spectrum. So as the light from those colors goes through the lens, they refract differently into the eye. And there are a couple of different models for why chromostereopsis might work, um, mostly revolving around the idea of chromatic aberration, such that because the red and blue bend differently, um, either longitudinally, one color will focus in front of the retina, uh, while another one is on, focused on the retina, causing you to see depth, or transverse ch chromatic aberration, which is similar, but uh, the colors um, land on your retina left versus right. Um, there, once again, center of gravity makes an appearance here. There's another model for how chromostereopsis works that tries to account for um, certain um, certain properties of this that are not explained by the other sort of more popular chromatic aberration models and it called center of gravity. It um, works, uh, it's too complicated to <laughs> explain here, but um, it's uh, a third model that uh, attempts to explain chromostereopsis, although none of these completely explain why some viewers will see blue in front of red instead of red in front of blue. So there's still work to be figured out here. Um, I think perhaps in this painting and in this one here, it's not just the um, chromatic aberration, but there's also a luminance effect because the gradients um, will fade off. Um, so for me, there's a really strong pronounced depth effect here on the smaller version of this painting on my screen. Um, as the bright yellow green fades off and then it kind of pops back up in front again over in the corners. Um, and I think that's, uh, so this is both kinds of chromostereopsis, I think working uh, in this particular piece. Um, similar metaphor of realization that eureka moment, getting your handle around an idea, this painting has two Turing pattern, or actually one Turing pattern at two different scales, if you look carefully. Um, one of the Turing patterns is painted with this pinkish gradient, the other one with this blue gradient, and the marks are either red and yellow or purple and cyan. One interesting thing about this piece is I read this here, this yellow, as being a yellow Turing pattern that proceeds into the blue and then comes out and continues. And this is a red part of the Turing pattern that comes through and goes through over here. But if you were actually to sample those colors, um, we're getting color constancy or sort of transparency effects where this color here is really not yellow, even though your eye might think of it as yellow being part of this pattern. Um, it's really a cyan. Similarly, this what reads as red here, to me at least, is actually purple paint. In addition to having my paintings so that they change appearance based on how far away you are, um, I also like to have them so that they um, change based on what the lighting is. It's a little difficult to capture in a photograph, but this piece is sitting on the mantel downstairs. Um, and uh, for me, there's a very strong depth effect on the left, but as the light goes down during the day, um, as our vision shifts from photopic to scotopic vision, um, there's sort of an intermediate stage where the peak sensitivity of our eyes shifts from the yellow green towards the yellow, towards the green blue, and the reds become darker faster. And what's left are our eyes are sensitive to the blue light. So this painting really glows in the early evening as the light goes down. In her uh, fantastic book, Margaret Livingstone uh, talks about how spatial frequency might be used by Leonardo to, for that elusive smile where our foveal vision picks up the high frequencies, where our peripheral vision looks at lower frequency parts of the image so that depending on where you look, you might capture the smile. I wanted to play around with that idea, clearly with much less subtlety than Leonardo and, and not nearly as successful either, but um, I wanted the idea of multiple touring patterns at uh, on top of each other. And it's kind of depending on where you look and how far back you are, you might perceive different amounts of depth or different parts of the painting that'll pop forward or push backwards. And scale is important as well. This painting is a small 12 by 12 inch painting. Um, when you're up close, you can see the individual marks and you can look at the Turing pattern. As you begin to move away, you might see more of an orb or an indentation. And as you stand even further back, you might see it as uh, a wave. 
Again, it's the kind of thing where I want to have an interactive experience between the viewer and my painting. I'll uh, finish up with this piece from um, called Seeing It Through, influenced by the philosopher Thomas Metzinger, author of The Ego Tunnel, who was thinking about um, transparency. And he says, transparency is a metaphor. Um, and he's really talking about consciousness. Consciousness is like a window we see through, but it's hard to experience the consciousness. We're unable to access the, the working mechanisms of our brain putting together our reality. All we get to see is the result. Uh, this piece has a lot of the things that I've talked about so far today, including metallic gold paint, spatial frequency, um, gradients, and touring patterns. I'll leave you with this uh, quote from Alfred North Whitehead. Art is the imposing of a pattern on experience, and our aesthetic enjoyment is recognition of the pattern. So with that, I thank you. Here's how you can find me. If any of you happen to be in New Jersey in the next couple of months, stop by the Center for Contemporary Art, where I'll have a about 30 pa paintings up. Again, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, would you like to um, sort of uh, leave that for a few seconds and people to write down your, uh, your website? And I'd really recommend people have a look at the, the um, you've got um, dozens of paintings, haven't you, on your website? Uh, yep, uh, hundreds, unfortunately. <laughs> Oh, like you say, you've been exhibiting 15 years, so that's yeah. uh, that's that, that's uh, brilliant. So, um, all right, I'm just going to bring up the chat window now. Um, so uh, maybe uh, there's a question here. I think it's for you. Um, uh, how long, on average, does the uh, does painting each of your works, um, say the smaller ones, take? You know, I, when I've given talks in the past, the first slide after my closing slide is a, usually a frequently asked question, which is that question. <laughs> I forgot to put it in this talk, but um, that's a very common question. The, uh, the small paintings typically take two to three days once they're designed uh, in terms of the painting. There's an underpainting and then the, the mark making. Um, and then they typically scale up fairly um, linearly, um, perhaps a little bit more complicated if the underpainting requires extra work or extra gradients, things like that. Okay. Um, there's a question here for um, director. Uh, hang on. It says mostly for David. So, uh, Ron, do you mind if I um, unmute, if you unmute? I'm unmuted. And I think for um, uh, for all of us, uh, possibly. Um, mostly. For you showed very nice influences of inferred illumination direction on shape perception. Uh, there is a role of inferred illumination on navigation where humans and animals use sunlight direction to navigate through the environment. Do painters use this idea? What on that? This is from Paul Martin. Our session today. I'm not quite sure I, I understand the question. Um, I think I think all artists imply illumination somehow, but uh, I'm not sure how it does um, how you use um, navigation how navigation comes into it. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's just an illusion of illumination. I'll go into that a little bit in my talk. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. All right, I might take that one on notice too. There's, 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 the questions are coming, piling in. Um, sorry, hmm. think about that one, Paul. Thank you for that. Um, Carl Jennings, is the perception of fluorescent colors contextual based on um, relative brightness of the environment? Um, uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, so the person to read about this, um, is um, um, oh god uh, sorry that was just a crazy metal blank Ralph Evans everyone should yeah. and he wrote about, um, about uh, our brilliance in the uh, in 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 uh, sort of uh, over uh, ten years or so later in his career and uh, uh, on on what came out positive 
posthumously in the 70s. And uh, that's, he really sort of uh, has a lot of interesting thoughts about um, brilliance. And I think people are still sort of starting to catch up with that, that idea. Um, so yes, yes, different, the, the same thing can appear fluorescent in a, um, in, in, in a, in, in a diff, in a in a suitable context that that appears to have blackness. Um, there, there's a well-known uh, um, uh, illusion by um, uh, per, uh, Purvis and Lotto. If you know Purvis and Lotto, they have a, a what's called the the, um, the Rubik's cube illusion, in which the uh, there's a, a tile um, depicted on the top plane and a, a tile depicted on the uh, shadow plane and um, in, in where the, and, and both are, are the same image color, but it appears um, a chocolate brown on the illuminated plane and uh, as a fluorescent or um, a highly fluorescent uh, orange on the shaded plane. So um, I, I expect uh, Carl would know that uh, example very well. All right, so many thanks uh, there for you. Andrew, box of action for the eyeballs. Um, absolutely brilliant. Oh, look at that. Wow. Okay, these are mostly then comments. Um, while painting, I guess this is for you, what percentage of your process goes as planned and how much is a surprise? Ah, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I tend to plan out my paintings pretty carefully ahead of time, um, but it doesn't always uh, work out the way I plan. I, I do a lot of design work on the computer. Um, and I think that I have colors on the computer that I'm going to be able to mix in my gradients. Uh, and I think that when I mix the gradients, they come out the way I had them planned on the computer. And very often it does work out the way I want, but every once in a while, uh, my endpoints are a little off or the paint is a little tra more transparent than I was expecting. And uh, I'm, it might not quite come out the way I had initially intended. Uh, sometimes it's not a problem and the piece works out nicely in the end. Uh, other times I maybe have to uh, go back and, and paint, paint over stuff. Um, um, there's a phase kind of in the middle of almost every one of my paintings where I start to get worried because half of it's a complete underpainting and half of it are my marks. And you know it, the, the pieces are not integrating yet but I've done this enough times that I now know that if I just keep going, I'll work through that part and then everything will sort of come together in the end. And hopefully if I've mixed the colors right, it'll be the way I envisioned it at the beginning. That's common. <laughs> That's good. There's another one here for you, Andrew. Um, does the texture of paint play any role in the concepts you're attempting to convey? Fascinating. I, you cut out on me there at the very end there, David. I, um, just just um, the fascinate, uh, does, does the texture of paint play any role in the concepts you're attempting to convey? Fascinating paintings, love them. Oh, thank you. Um, there's not a lot of texture in most of my paintings. They tend to be fairly flat. Um, there are a few times when I've uh, wanted to go that way and experiment with it, but um, for the most part, they are not. And that is really one dimension that I'm not, not playing with very much. Um, occasionally there'll be, um, there'll be a paint that is not so fluid and it retains a little bit of brush stroke so that there will be a little bit of extra surface temp, um, texture. And if you catch the raking light, you'll see, um, the little bumps and shadows, but, um, that's more an artifact than something I'm, I'm designing into the paintings at this point. Oh. Great. All right. Um, did, uh, Ron, did you have a question for Andrew or, um, or me? Um, I, well, I do, yeah. I wanted to use the chat, but I didn't want to type and miss out on what he was saying. So uh, I thought I would leave it. Oh, that's right. we, um, we... Andrew, when you're mixing your um, graded paint nuts, do you have to, do you find you have to remix those later or do you use them in one session? Uh, well, I'm using acrylic paints and what I have is a, what's called a stay wet palette. So there's um, uh, yeah, water and, and paper towels underneath a sheet of paper that holds the wetness and um, use a little bit of a, like a Clorox sheet underneath that, in fact, to help keep the, um, any uh, bacteria growth 
So I can keep the pallet sometimes as long as several weeks going. Um, so even oh, wow. on the larger, yeah, and even on the larger paintings. Now, if I put too much water in it, the paint can get a little soupy and that's not so good for um, the, the work and you end up fighting it sometimes. I really don't wanna to have to remix the gradients. Um, mm -hmm. So I try to, I've, I've come to the conclusion I have to waste paint and I just have to mix enough that I know that I'm gonna be able to cover the whole surface and not have to mix a spot in the middle somewhere. Yeah, thank you. Um, David, I've got a question for you if I can ask it now. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, while I was researching for this conference, uh, I, I passed a comment. It was a scientific article. I, I can't actually remember it very well because I was looking for something else. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is there a wavelength um, is there a wavelength that will stimulate only the L cones in your eyes? Uh, yes, yeah, that, that's right. At, at the extreme end of the uh, extreme long wavelengths would would only ex um, stimulate the L cone. Okay, well, a simple question, simple answer. Thank you. <laughs> simple questions are good. <laughs> Great. All right. 